Hello, everyone. Welcome to the weekly colloquium of the Center for Theoretical Physics. And today we have a pleasure of talk by Markus Huber from um, Technical University in Wien, where he is a professor of quantum information and thermodynamics and also an associated group leader at the Institute for Quantum Optics and Quantum Information at the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Uh, Marcus did his undergraduate studies, PhD, and first postdoc at the University of uh, Vienna. Then he moved around uh, a bit um, uh, across Europe, uh, including postdoc in uh, Bristol, uh, University, Autonomous University of uh, Barcelona, University of Geneva, and uh, since 2016, he is back in his hometown, as far as I understand, Wien. And today we'll have a uh, talk on the thermodynamics. We'll hear a talk on the thermodynamics of quantum measurements. Marcus, the ground is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the very nice introduction and for the invitation in the first place. I'm very sorry this time I couldn't make it, but I do hope this will be rectified in the near future. And um, yes, so I thought given the context of the invitation, it would be nice to talk a little bit about the thermodynamics of quantum measurements, especially as I know there are some experts in the audience, um, but I was also asked to give a bit of, of a general background into the whole reason that this is a question and there are many angles from which this can be thought of. So let, let's start with, uh, an ideal quantum measurement as it is in the textbook. Um, so, okay, I'm, I'm not very good at making graphics or slides. I'm more used to blackboards, but uh, if you bear with me, let's assume there is a quantum system that we want to measure. If you then open a standard quantum mechanics textbook, something very complicated happens and this, whatever this is, this classical machinery at some point displays a measurement outcome. Uh, say I can distinguish a finite number of different orthogonal states and I can label these outcomes with some uh, integer i. And according to the postulates of quantum mechanics, uh, the state post measurement would thus be conditioned on the classical outcome, this kind of post measurement state. And which basically is, I mean, typically these EI would actually just be projectors onto a one dimensional subspace. So you just have a specific pure state and an associated probability. That's when you open the textbook on quantum measurements. And possibly we all know and heard a lot about uh, interpretational issues there. I mean, where is this quantum to classical divide? And actually from the interpretational side, depending on the stance, there has been a lot of excellent work also by members in the audience on this whole notion that is sometimes called quantum Darwinism and, or other approaches where one can try to understand that this classical measurement apparatus is in some sense also just a very, very many body quantum device plus a quantum environment. And somehow unitarily these interactions should give rise to the correct post measurement states. Um, but my main background is not so much the foundations of quantum mechanics. I don't think I have anything deep to say here. I'm really interested in thermodynamics and specifically about thermodynamics of quantum systems. And so here in classical thermodynamics, there is a lot of convenient things that do not apply in the quantum realm. For one, if I think about the thermodynamics of a classical system, I can just assume that the cost of measurement essentially is negligible. Like if I think about a moving car, like measuring its position, it's not a big factor in determining the work that the engine performs because the engine performs a lot of work. Uh, also, it's done passively just by some reflected sunlight. Also, the measurement will have no back action. Yes, I mean, of course, if I shoot with a photon in a car, 
it will impart some momentum, but compared to the car's momentum, it's completely negligible. And, um, but all of these things are no longer true in the quantum realm. So I think it's entirely obvious if I now start shooting a photon at a single atom, there will be back action. And actually the cost of that measurement will be at a similar scale. And frankly, most theories of quantum thermodynamics, if you can call them that, don't actually have a good answer. And maybe that's also because we don't even have a good understanding of the quantum measure. So what thermodynamics could there be? Well, so let's think about these three laws in a very simplified manner. So there's this famous first law that the energy change of a system can always be split in the work and the heat contribution. Um, and energy is conserved. But what about measuring an energy superposition state? What actually, like, if, if, if my measurement collapses the energy superposition, what actually happens? And you could say, well, somehow mysteriously in the measurement apparatus, the energy must be compensated to, to save the first law. This is not so much a first principle derivation, but just saying I elevate the thermodynamic laws to fundamental principles and then. I can say something about the energetics. Um, and of course, there are many questions related to this, but then furthermore, the second law, if you, it's kind of clear that it cannot apply to the system that is being measured, right? Because you start with some finite entropy and post measurement, there is zero entropy. So clearly you reduce the, the entropy of the system that you're measuring which may be fine, it's not a closed system, and you can again postulate in some manner the entropy increase of the measurement apparatus must at least compensate for the measurement decrease in the system that is being measured. But of course, again, this is not from first principles. This is just, if you believe the second law of thermodynamics to be universally true, well, then it kind of has to be the case. And then there's the third law of thermodynamics that depending on which formulation you take, there's this kind of one famous version is the so-called Nernst unattainability principle. It basically says that the zero entropy state or the ground state is essentially unattainable. So to go from a finite temperature system to a zero temperature system, you'll have to invest in a diverging amount of work. As you approach zero, this basically diverges to infinity. It's a very simplified version, but, um, but here it's odd because this is now clearly at odds with the previous measurement postulate. Like say I want to measure and my post measurement state should be pure. So for instance, I measure a thermal state in the energy eigenbasis. It basically tells me with a high probability I'll find the ground state and the post measurement state will be the pure ground state of the system. This is of course in, 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 in violation of the third law because that would tell me I need an infinite amount of work to actually reach that pure state. And I can no longer just conveniently shift it to the measurement apparatus, because that would tell me that my measurement apparatus will have to invest an infinite amount of work. So that is why we were interested in understanding a little bit more the thermodynamics of a quantum measurement procedure. But uh, in the thermodynamics, we also have a zero law. Yes. And it's somehow missing. And I also have a question about the third law. I okay. Mean, oh, yes. at least this, this little print that entropy goes to zero, that's incorrect. The third law is not actually a law. It's a, it's a hypothesis by Nernst. And there are many cases where this is not true. The entropy is not going to zero when temperature goes to zero. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. At least okay. absolute zero, and uh, in addition, I mean, and with unless we know what you mean by the zero law, 
of thermodynamics for a small quantum systems, then it's very difficult to say what is meant by temperature going to zero. Thank you very much. These are two wonderful points. So, of course, I've glossed over a lot of details here. I mean, indeed, this indent entropy goes to zero is only true if the ground state is non-degenerate. If the ground state is degenerate, you'll have temperature zero, but not entropy zero, for instance. Uh, and in that case, it is indeed a hypothesis. And furthermore, how all three laws actually apply to the quantum case is a matter of debate to some extent, because- But okay. uh, the four law, the, the, I mean, I, I insist that the zero law is extremely important. In oh, I absolutely that. agree. But Therefore, indeed. there are four laws, and the third law is somehow related to the zero law. And in addition, it's not entirely true that the entropy is zero for non-degenerate system, because you might have a system where the density of states next to the absolute zero are degenerate. And that is the consequence of the fact that thermodynamics apply to a complicated systems which have a tremendously complicated. Uh, pardon, I propose that maybe we postpone this to a further discussion and and continue with the talk to stay on time. Ah, yeah, as you want. I'm, yeah. I'm always happy to discuss these fundamental yeah, issues. I, I, but I, I suggest, guys, this is all yeah. very interesting. But I suggest to maybe keep some uh, some pace to allow you convey the main message. And then we are open to all kinds of comments, discussions, and uh, well, and questions. Thank yeah, you. Um, but ju ju just to say, I think I agree with you, and I have a lot of things to say on the topic. But let's do this after what I actually want to talk about. Yeah. Um, okay. So this is just some musings on thermodynamics. So um, how could I think of a measurement? in a way that actually incorporates the thermodynamic resources. And here, um, there is a split one can do, and that has been shown by many people, um, where you think of first, basically, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing this kind of quantum circuit decomposition of the process. So you should think as time going from left to right. And so you start with a quantum system and what we call a pointer you correlate them with a controlled unitary, um, this USP, that basically should create a correlated system pointer state. Now the pointer might be larger or smaller, but it's still a very well controlled quantum system that basically now the pointer states should reflect the internal states of the quantum system in the measurement basis you care about. This process is often referred to as pre-measurement. And then at some point, the information needs to become classical for which the aforementioned quantum Darwinism is a convenient self-contained solution where we can at least write down a dynamical model of the measurement uh, that doesn't need to refer to any collapse. So here, um, essentially, um, an uncontrolled interaction between the pointer and the environment leads to a global state, which is said to have kind of spectrum broadcast structure, which basically means that the, uh, the environment basically correctly uh, is conditioned on the measurement outcome, or in other words, looking at the environment of this pointer allows you to draw conclusions about the outcome of a measurement uh, for most subsets of the environment that are large enough. So what could this be? What could I imagine here? Say I'm measuring the polarization of a single photon. So first the single photon would slide along, then it would maybe go towards a polarizing beam splitter, a controlled interaction that basically correlates the path with the polarization, uh, yielding two input channels of a detector, 
that basically can be distinguished like as clicking A or clicking B. And, and actually that click is then amplified via typically say an avalanche photodiode or a nanowire detector. And then, and then in this out of equilibrium to equilibrium transition that basically the, the detector actually clicks, there's this avalanche, there's this massive thermodynamic transition, this irreversible one. And then the information is basically broadcast simply by virtue of a large thermodynamic current and then maybe a display in the computer and it basically says zero and then the photons displaying zero are broadcast all over the environment until I think there can be no longer an argument whether this information is now classified. But just is just to, to break down this process into two unitary evolutions, one of them being controlled and deliberate, the pre-measurement, and the other one being kind of emergent and autonomous, this kind of quantum Darwinism or the, the spectrum broadcast. Um, now let's look at the requirements that these measurements fulfill or these interactions need to fulfill these post measurement states that I wrote as rho sp tilde and rho sps tilde. And from an ideal perspective, the correlations in the pre-measurement, they need to be faithful, i.e. the uh, if I can identify projections onto pointer subspaces or pointer states, let's call it, and system states in the, in the basis I want to measure in, then of course, uh, the, essentially the pointer states need to reflect the system states. In other words, I need to, like very stupidly said, if the pointer points in direction I, the system pre-measurement pre should have been in the state I. And they should also be unbiased. So the, yeah, this is actually what I just said. Um, sorry, the confusion. And they need to be non-invasive. So in the med, non-invasive actually I realize it's a bad term because of course quantum measurements are invasive. But what actually needs to happen is that the, um, the diagonal element of the system state before and after the measurement need to be the same in the measurement basis. So essentially the effect of a measurement on average would just be decohering, decohering in the measurement basis. And, and faithful, just to say it better, it just means perfect correlations. In other words, uh, that um, whenever the, the pointer points in direction I, the system points in the direction I after measurement. And this is kind of the pre-measurement conditions. These are essentially all necessary conditions for these postulates to hold and sufficient if you take them all together. And for objectivity or the second process, people have defined uh, the so-called spectrum broadcast structure that basically means that, uh, again, my state should be in a highly correlated state that essentially the, all the environments, like I label from E1 to EN, should be in a conditional state depending on the pointer state I. In that way, the information about the pointer is broadcast to the environment. Okay, then there are some orthogonality conditions and strong independence conditions. I won't really get into details, but essentially this is the mathematical structure that is sought after in the second part. And if we now look at it ideally, we can now think of it uh, as a lot, like the picture before, I can think of this classical apparatus, in fact, as a very, very large quantum system. And essentially, uh, if, I, if I think of the previous unitaries and this, what this basically means is that the macro state of the environment kind of becomes distinguishable as a function of the input quantum state. And, and so, how would this actually look like? So for instance, in this idealized pure state quantum world, 
I could have a quantum system, say in a superposition of the measurement basis I'm interested in. I have an event ready detector that is again just a pure state. And I have a thermal environment that just starts out in the zero state because it's a non degenerate ground state at zero temperature. And then the pre measurement would just be a C naught. Then the system and pointer would perfectly be correlated and become an entangled state in the measurement basis. And in the next state, I, I basically, okay, I don't want to go through all the mathematical details. It's rather straightforward. It's essentially, you can think of it as uh, a really microscopic number of C nodes between the pointer and each individual subpart of the environment. And if, if the conditions are, as I just outlined them here before, this leads to a perfect SBS structure. So in that respect, one can say, ah, we're done. I mean, it kind of works. We can do the pre-measurement, we can do the whole spectrum broadcast, we can do quantum Darwinism, and we can be happy because it basically perfectly reproduces all the tenets of the axioms of the projection postulate of quantum mechanics. But of course, it kind of says very little on the thermodynamic cost and the entropy production or the thermodynamic laws, simply because we've idealized the system beyond recognition in the sense that we assume everything to be in a pure state. Whereas once we go to very large system sizes, we know, and depending on how you interpret the third law, but essentially pure states are a convenient fiction that don't exist. And what we should actually do is work with uh, thermal states, which are, for instance, characterized by full rank. So the rank is equal to the dimension of the system. And so what could this more realistic modeling look like? Here you could think about a quantum system that comes as a, well, some density matrix that has some off-diagonal elements and diagonal elements in the measurement basis. A pointer, which is essentially a previously equilibrium thermal state of a large quantum system that via some deliberate unitary is driven out of equilibrium in a detection ready state. And usually conventionally one should also make the pointer temperature initially to be much larger than, uh, much smaller than the environment temperature. So the beta, the inverse temperature of the detector should be basically small enough such that small thermal fluctuations aren't of the order of the energy scale of the quantum system in order to get very little dark counts. As most of us know, to get like good single photon detectors, we're actually looking for uh, driving a system close to a critical edge where the thermal fluctuations are suppressed. And for that, we basically need a lot of cooling. And and the thermal environment, well, that we cannot control overall. We can't just demand the entire environment to be at a low temperature. So this just is a gigantic thermal state at some inverse temperature of our local lab. And so the pre-measurement here uh, has some properties due to the full rank nature of the system and, and, and the pointer, we realize that faithfulness is an impossible quality because what we're really wanting here is that the entire population of the system point to post measurement state lives in a small dimensional subspace. And this is the version of the third law I'm referring to. It's, it's very easy to prove. I mean, if you look at any system at full rank and another system, and you then look at the unitary orbit, um, the marginals of the system will still have full rank. So you cannot reduce the rank to zero. Or in other words, in the unitary orbit of a quantum evolution of full rank states, there is no rank one state. So pure state does not live in the unitary orbit or, or the natural quantum evolution of, 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 of full rank system. So in other words, if you start at finite temperature, you cannot exactly get to rank one. You can only approximate it. And this is one version to understand the third law analytically in the quantum domain. So we know that faithfulness is an impossible property to demand. 
And in fact, it also turns out that we cannot demand simultaneously unbiasedness or non invasiveness. We have to kind of make a choice. One of them can be salvaged. But due to the thermal nature of the pointer and the finite rankness of the resulting state, we have to make a choice. We can either have the measurement be, or the correlation should rather say to be unbiased or non invasive. And the other one will then automatically be violated. So generically, we choose unbiased, and it just turns out that the measurement will neither be faithful nor non invasive, which in other terms means that sometimes the pointer will just point in the wrong direction, and the post measurement state will not be the one given by the projection postulate, but basically sometimes do something random. And the lower the temperature, the less pronounced these effects are. So you need to basically invest a lot of work to pre prepare the measurement apparatus far from equilibrium, to prepare the measurement correctly. And this is kind of the thermodynamic, how thermodynamics enters here. There's a lot of work to be invested because uh, in order to approximate the projection postulate, you need to basically get close to a system that essentially satisfies these three axioms. And the next question here is, of course, the autonomous version of this quantum Darwinism, like how can a natural evolution, a natural closed system evolution with a time independent Hamiltonian lead a uh, point the thermal environment state to a new equilibrium state of the depleted detector at the new thermal environment in such a way that the environment retains information about the detector states, i.e. the thermal state of this joint system should naturally be the um, this so-called spectrum broadcast state. And there are a lot of results in thermodynamics on dynamical equilibration where a closed system that basically starts out with zero entropy in a very specific state naturally equilibrates in a dynamical sense uh, via time averaging. And so we wanted to ask, is this possible in such a way that a detector can signal and broadcast information to the entire environment? And this is essentially the, the, the central uh, result of this preprint we put on archive, which I think was the prompt for the seminar invitation. Well, the idea is the following. We wanted to characterize which kind of Hamiltonians would be needed such that an initial pointer quantum state and initial thermal environment states would, in a time averaging sense, i.e., we look at the time average, the integral over zero to TDT of a time dependent rho, uh, one over T, and, and look at the infinite limit. So, um when does this kind of dynamically equilibrated state equal an SBS state? And what we were able to show, the only technical result really is that this type of Hamiltonian is the only Hamiltonian that can achieve this. And for these environment states, we don't actually get perfect SBS structure because these states are not orthogonal, but the fidelity between tier two of those as a proxy for orthogonality, they're basically a initial state dependent constant times a size of the environment fraction. So if you look at large enough environments or subsystems, fractions of the environment, then at some point you will actually find this SBS structure. Um, yes. And so how to understand this, I mean, it, it's not even so surprising. I mean, what, what is written here is actually the most intuitive thing that you would think is that essentially to do this, you need to act on the environment conditioned on the state of the pointer. So depending on which state the pointer is in, there needs to be a different evolution of the environment. Otherwise, you cannot create this conditional state. But sadly, actually, and then if you look at actual atom physics or quantum field theory, Lagrangians and things, you realize 
this form of the Hamiltonian is actually not a very natural one, considering. So um, there's much more work to be done in this direction, um, but, but just to see how would this look like? How, if I look at this typical atom physics energy structure, say I want to measure whether this atom is in an excited state here on the left, and this is kind of my measurement apparatus plus environment energy structure. What it really needs is I need to be kind of trapped in a very low dimensional subspace, a meta stable state where the natural evolution basically is trapped. So if I do the natural time independent unitary, like any closed system evolution only takes place in degenerate subspaces because you can't really get out of them. So if, 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 if there are no other degeneracies here in the subspace where the detector environment lives, I mean, kind of a metastable state that I'm trapped here, which basically means I remain macroscopically distinct, like the event ready avalanche photodiode. And what then needs to happen is that essentially, first, uh, the, the atom needs to give off a quantum of energy, then the system rises up to one of the other levels, which is now in a huge degenerate subspace. And from here, the natural unitary evolution will essentially equilibrate in a dynamical sense and therefore reach a new equilibrium. And then this state is now macroscopically distinct from this previous state. And this way you will have a, an environment that has a stable, macro state that depends on the state of the atom before, which is one realization of this model or of such a Hamiltonian. So in other words, to create such a Hamiltonian, it can only be, it's not a natural Hamiltonian in physics, but it's one that you can create as an effective Hamiltonian given a metastable input state, which is actually what we see when we're trying to design quantum measurement devices. And I am running out of the, promise time. So I'll move to the conclusion of this overview. So again, my, my very, uh, I, I, I skipped the zero flaw and I go straight into the first law and we don't understand the first law on the quantum level, but it, it, this energy conservation is kind of important for kind of this blocking the formalization or being in a metastable state, but what actually happens to the energy of the total system, I, I still don't know. I mean, is energy conserved in a measuring, measurement only on average or explicitly? It's, it's not entirely clear. Um, the second law, well, globally it holds, obviously, I mean, globally it's a unitary, but again, what the second law means in a quantum realm is a bit ambiguous because a closed system evolves unitarily, doesn't actually change its entropy, yet closed systems do equilibrate in a meaningful sense. And there's all of these works from eigenstate formalization to dynamical equilibration to canonical typicality of subsystems and entanglement. But what it really means for the second law to hold and what the actual entropy compensation is of a measurement is very difficult to say. And this version of the third law that I said is essentially, essentially just the impossibility of reaching a pure state via unitary evolution from a maximally mixed state or a maximum rank state in the beginning basically limits this fidelity, uh, faithfulness, unbiasedness, and non invasiveness. So I kind of have to, like, my measurement has to be imperfect. However, it doesn't actually limit SBS as you would think because SBS also inhabits only a, a very small or low rank sector of my entire Hilbert space because of its correlated nature. If I think back on the SBS state here, um, this SBS state, the row infinity state, because all the I's are correlated, all the sectors of Hilbert space where I and J are different are not populated. So it's actually extremely low rank, which also means it's technically not ever in the full unitary orbit, but you can make it so that most of the population starts moving into this subspace 
and thereby creating an SPS state as the number of or the size of the environment goes towards the thermodynamic limit or goes towards classicality. So I realize what I've shown is very little technical results, but they're more like straightforward to prove. I'm happy to discuss them in detail, but I thought I would stay general. And mostly questions to, to reinvigorate maybe a bit of interest to say that actually, I think we cannot have a full theory of quantum thermodynamics without understanding the thermodynamics of measurements because they really matter in the quantum realm. And this is essentially what we're trying to do. And it's not work I've done by myself. There is collaborators, Max Locke, Nico Fries, Tom Rivlin, Manu Schwarzhans, Jelena Kurianova, and Felix Binder, to name just a few that were on these papers I mentioned. And yeah, I'd be very happy to discuss all of this in detail. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Marcus, for the nice talk. So we have quite some time. Let's open the discussion. Could I ask something? Yes, yes, please, please. Okay, um, concerning the first law of, the, of thermodynamics, when you are saying that there is a question, a somehow unresolved question over the energy here, I think I would understand it in the following way. If I have a, uh, uh, if my state is, if my system is in the superposition state of two states, A and B, of different energies, and then at the end, I find that it was A, or I find that it was B, it doesn't mean that the energy has changed. Because if I understand uh, this superposition as the information rather than reality, then mm -hmm. there is no problem. Simply, if I got A at the very beginning, it means that it was A on the entrance. Yeah, but I mean, but you realize this is a deep open question. I agree with you. Of course, be... of course, of course. But that's how uh, I would say it's not a question. It's a, it's a remark. That's how I would cure, so to say, any, any, any difficulty related to the energy of the first law of thermodynamics. Yes, and, but I must say there are actually two difficulties. One of them is the whole question of energy and what is the energy of a superposition. It's also a question in quantum gravity, right? I mean, how does a superposition take gravitate? Does it as E1, as E2, or as the yeah. superposition of both? Uh, and, and secondly, actually this division in work and heat also becomes very non-unique because yeah. there's a whole debate about what is work and what is heat in quantum systems. So Absolutely anyway. no way of defining it in a firm way. Yeah. Okay, I uh, agree, I agree. I agree. What I what I just what I'm stressing is that if you know the mean value of the, the energy, it's only a statement related to many shots, not to yes. a single copy. I think that everybody agrees on. <laughs> yeah. So may I? Yes, please. <clears throat> I also have uh, remarked about the first uh, law of thermodynamic. You know this in in in, quant in classical st statistical physics. It's not the law of dynamics, and uh, the measurement must be adiabatic. So if you make very quick measurement, the law, this law doesn't doesn't have any sense. Yes. Exactly. So and in quantum mechanics, the uh, uh, function reduces immediately, and you want to somehow think about it in terms of first law of thermodynamics. That's something seems to me contradictory. Maybe I don't understand them. You know, not, um, not every change of energy is, uh, can be considered in terms of first law of thermodynamics. Yes, of course, sorry. Um, I do agree, um, but also here the question is, I mean, could I even do a measurement adiabatically quantum systems like what, what what is actually the time it takes for this wave function to reduce or for this information to become classical i i agree there is something called quantum jumps which is of course not present in classical mechanics yeah and i mean in i, I just put it there in a, in a really no. stupid formulation because i think to be honest i think it is still 
there's a lot of effort in classical or in quantum statistical mechanics that has been invested into how the classical first uh, classical laws of thermodynamics can be realized or derived from first principles as a large scale limit of quantum considerations. But what actually happens here, I mean, maybe there is no first law that applies. That's that's entirely an option. And there's a good reason to believe so. But but still, what is the energy change? And can I consider like what is the work cost of performing a measurement is still a meaningful question. Yeah. Well, yeah, I understand. But even in classical mechanics, if you do a very quick measurement, then the the same question arises. You now, if you kick mm -hmm. the gas. Then you have uh, um, shock waves, and they cannot be you know, described by anything, just by dynamics, not thermodynamics. Yes, I mean, the point here being that essentially most of classical thermodynamics works well in the equilibrium case, or the laws yeah. work in the equilibrium case, but of course, quantum systems are fundamentally immediately out of equilibrium, even if you touch them slightly, which makes all the transferal of classical laws wrong or just not meaningful. At the same time, we want to understand out of equilibrium thermodynamics. So. Okay, um, any more questions from the audience? Um, so I would, if, if there is another question, I would also go ahead, ask, go ahead, please. Go ahead, please. Um, listen, in, Victor. in statistical physics, the problem is always, you know, to prove that the system, which is described by given Hamiltonian, that this system relaxed to the thermodynamic equilibrium is, uh, you know, it's a problem which has been solved only for few systems. Yes. And uh, this question I see doesn't even arise in quantum mechanics, such as mixing and Lapunov exponent and, you know, this. And just trying to, you know, find the contact in a kennel. For instance, I remember you said that it, in the system which is closed, you said that mm, entropy is concerned, or maybe or it cannot be produced. Maybe I was. No, no, what, what I said is if you take the axioms of quantum mechanics and the closed system, it evolves unitarily. And unitarily, the von Neumann entropy of the system doesn't actually change. Okay, in, right. in, in classical mechanics, if the system is uh, closed, then it, uh, evolution is described by the Newton laws. Then the measure is conserved. In this sense, you, you can say this is also unitarity. But we know that entropy is something different because in classical mechanics, there is dynamical entropy, Kolmogor, Sina entropy, and so on. So what, what is the counterpart in, in quantum mechanics of this? So how to make unitary uh, evolution into entropy in classical mechanics it's possible exactly so like the, the the quantum version of h theorem so there are some people working on like um coarse grained entropies um or basically um i mean it, it, it's one set of approaches is all like observational entropy it's called of coarse grained states because you say there are certain microstates you can no longer distinguish or the big other approach is the so-called eigenstate formalization hypothesis approach, where you only talk about reasonable physical observables, which are by nature very degenerate, like local observables are just very few eigen uh, distinct eigenvalues compared to the system size. And, and from the perspective of such physically reasonable observables, the system then looks entropic in terms of the outcome statistics offset observables simply because you cannot resolve the entire system and generically the entire evolution even the, even the eigenstates they live in such an basically in, in a block sphere and in such an orthogonal plane that it looks completely random so there are many different answers and some of them are more or less accepted and as you say the eigenstate formalization hypothesis not only has it not been proven to hold for all systems, it's been proven to not hold for integrable systems and a lot of other things. So the question how this entropy arises and what size it is still... Uh, pardon, please, non-speakers, please mute the microphones because there is a little bit of noise. Thank you. 
Yeah. So anyway, um, um, and and this whole notion of equilibration is actually a prerequisite we took here, and we took one version of closed system equilibration, this dynamical equilibration via averages, which works well, which basically lets most systems that are do not have conserved quantities equilibrate. At the same time, you can also argue that this is maybe not the best notion or not, whatever. I'm, um, I feel like the second law still needs a lot of research as it applies to closed quantum systems on a kind of uh, intermediate scale, not the classical and not just one or two quantum systems, but like a quantum anybody scale. A okay. short remark, Thank you. If I may. Yes, please, please, Carol. Please Hello. Go ahead. Yes, thanks, Marcus, for your talk. But now a short remark to the previous question. So, for many years, people studied quantum versions of dynamical Kolmogorov Sinai entropies, and such an approach was used. It's not very uh, practical to compute them, but in principle, it's possible to define such quantities which, in the classical limit, converge exactly to the classical values. But they are not easy to, to work with in quantum setup. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I've read about this, but I never understood. I mean, I must admit, I never understood their operational meaning, except for the classical limit being well defined. Well, in some cases, you compute that the entropies diverge, but their difference can be shown to be finite and to converge to the classical values. Okay. Yes, yes, exactly. The mathematics is, is nice and beautiful, but you know, as an information theorist, I always like to know, ah, this entropy means this specific, I don't know, information compression, coding rate. I know this and that about the system. So like in terms of operational interpretation of the quantity, I was always confused what these actually mean. But mm -hmm. Thank you. It's not to say anything against it. It's just my shortcoming of not understanding. OK, uh, thank you. More questions? Oh, can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding the SB structure and uh, summarization. Do you do you think uh, uh, a summarization requires SBS structure or not? Do you mean the other way around, whether SBS requires formalization or? I mean, because uh, the summarized state uh, has objectivity, obviously, right? Because the summarized state has uh, objectivity. When you try to measure something uh, on the summarized state, uh, you clearly uh, have uh, objectivity. So then, which, which means actually, if we believe SBS structure, for as a requirement of uh, objectivity, somehow ob objectivity uh, and uh, the SBS structure condition uh, must provide uh, this summarization or like summarization is in independent process uh, than uh, uh, from the... I mean, yeah. I... I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer. This is my central question. Like, there, there's also been some other good papers on this, but when is formalization really compatible with SBS structure? Mm -hmm. um, when, so, in, in, in what cases does the formal environment of my pointer actually carry information about the outcome and in which cases does it not? I, I, I the one thing I know is that for sure it's not generic. I mean, not okay. every system in the world is a good measurement apparatus. I need to carefully design and prepare it because otherwise the environment couldn't care less about the internal state of my measurement apparatus. Okay, thank you very much. Can I make a short comment? Yes, please. Uh, I, I believe we are closing the discussion pretty soon. So I would like just to make a comment that there is a, a very beautiful little book on statistical mechanics, which is a volume in the Berkeley course. Mm -hmm. and it's beautiful because it was written by experimental physicists, Rife. 
and the discussion of all these points about the faithfulness and uh, uh, other points you mentioned are discussed in the Book of Life without actually making a distinction between the stati between the quantum and classical systems. Because I, I spell the name? Because I don't understand how do you can make a difference between quantum and classical uh, systems in thermodynamics. I mean, thermodynamics is a science which, as it was already mentioned in the discussion, refers to a, such a project physical processes like, for example, thermalization, which requires a large systems, huge systems. So therefore, the distinction between the classical and quantum system becomes, uh, well, rather obscure. Similarly, like the pr problem of ergodicity, remarkably, there is a slide now on the screen, which equation number three, if you if I count from the top, is that not an assumption about the ergodicity in the system? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, if I understand more that, than that, but it is, indeed, it is the 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 ever time average is equal to the ensemble average, right? So that assumption is basically assumption. So. I think the word thermodynamics is overused here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for this uh, provocative statement. That is, of course, uh, uh, just to comment, maybe uh, that is, of course, a big debate with, uh, which has been going on uh, pretty actively recently. What is quantum thermodynamics? I think this basic question is still, uh, is still not fully understood. Uh, so obviously, and I then I can to shout that I disagree. Thermodynamics is pretty well defined. No, no, no. I mean, what is what is meant by quantum thermodynamics? Ah, this, well, I mean, then why yes, don't you, why don't you invent a different word? Well, we can invent quantum schmantum, for example. But in 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 any case, the the analysis of a uh, large scale. Uh, quantum systems and they sort of uh, average behavior. It's a it's a valid question. It's a na natural approach, I would say. Yeah. However, no, however, mean, however, you call it, but well. But the point is the following: If I have a very small system, how do I know that it is in a given quantum mechanical state? Well, only by measurements. Yeah. This yeah, is... so you so you have to have another uh, before exactly. you define this, you have another ensemble which you use to define these states. And then yeah. you call it to another system which has yet another ensemble which allow me to label the states for the environment. And that you can multiply going on and on and on and on. So uh, this the, yeah, but still, I, I, I technically agree with you, and I think there is a debate, and I also agree that equilibrium thermodynamics in the classical case is very well defined. Out of equilibrium thermodynamics already has some open questions, and quantum thermodynamics may or may not be a bad term, depending on who you talk to, because it seems like an oxymoron almost. At the same time, coming from quantum technologies, I think they're very valid and operational questions, like really how much energy does it take? How much work do I need to invest? What's the power usage of running a quantum computer, of, of measuring a single photon? And yeah, this is a very good comment because this is a precisely the point taken by Rife in his Berkeley mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. that the first law of aerodynamics make a distinction between the work and the heat. And what is heat and what is the work is precisely defined by the Rife. And I strongly advise you uh, to look it up and perhaps you will then agree or disagree with my comment that the Rife has make. Uh, I mean, at that time, there was no discussion about the quantum measurements and so forth. No, people didn't uh, consider that so important as today. 
but um, okay, that that's what I said. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, before we run out of time, if I may, I would have a question. Well, I would have actually a ton of questions, but not to bore you. Uh, Marcos, uh, do I understand correctly that what you prove in the paper is that this Hamiltonian, which is at the top of the of the slide, is the only one which, after infinite time averaging, uh, gives a reasonably close approach to SBS state. Yes. Is it is it the is it the statement? That is the statement with minor technical caveats, but yes. Ah, okay, very good, very good, because th that was quite a quite a big question. So uh, at some point we were thinking, what kind of uh, Hamiltonian Hamiltonians, or actually what kind of interactions, would lead in some sense to SBS structure. And it looks like you have answered this question that if you take the infinite uh, infinite uh, time averaging, that the only structure is the, the this Hamiltonian at the top, which we call uh, actually the evolution that it generates, we call it controlled unitary. So as as far as I understand, you, you mentioned that it's not very physical, obviously, because there are no self Hamiltonians for the uh, central system, right? Mm -hmm. Plus, plus, of course, if you take, for example, uh, electrodynamics in three dimensions, then the, let's say, dipole type of interaction will produce three terms like that, which not necessarily commute, which spoils things over. Exactly. Okay. But this is what we're currently working on. This is just, I, I, I can tell you that, uh, well, actually, while the Hamiltonian doesn't exist, it doesn't have to, right? As we're used to in quantum information, we constantly work with Hamiltonians that don't fundamentally exist, right? Sure. But all the interactions that we need in quantum computers and gates and all of these things, it's fine if they're effective, conditioned on some state and so on. So actually, you can create a lot of reasonable Hamiltonians if you, if you condition on the right input state. So if we will not have this Hamiltonian, but given a specific input state of the pointer, that is in a suitable small section of Hilbert space, the effective evolution looks as if it was induced by this Hamiltonian, whereas the real Hamiltonian will have many more terms. But we don't Very care good. because they all act on some orthogonal subspace that we can just throw away. Very good. Just as a, as a quick comment, if I may, we had some long time ago, we had this uh, highly, highly speculative hypothesis. Please don't laugh at me. But we have this highly speculative hypothesis that, first of all, these types of Hamiltonian are the only effective Hamiltonian which leads to SBS, to the, the, those objective states. Then the speculative reasoning, the second speculative even more part, was that, OK, since we see objectivity in the uh, macroscopic world, then perhaps these effective Hamiltonians are omnipresent and perhaps they are responsible for the quick thermalization times that we observe. Please mm -hmm. don't laugh at me. It was, uh, it, was, it was just a, you know, just a sort of mental exercise, like letting your thoughts go wild. No, that's like, I, yeah. I was very happy you contacted me because maybe we can after the seminar or in an email exchange. Yes, I would be. I would be. I would be happy not to bore not to bore people. Uh, I would be happy to to talk. So maybe let me ask for the last time if there are any questions or comments from the audience. Well, if this is not the case, then let's uh, thank our speaker Marcus again. Thank you very much, Marcus, for the talk and the inspiring discussion.